Hello everyone, this is Akash from College Junior. Today I am with Dr. Sarji Gopina, Vice Chancellor of Digital University Kelra. A small introduction about him. Dr. Sarji Gopina is the first Vice Chancellor of newly formed Kerala University of Digital Sciences, Innovation and Technology, which is known as Digital University Kerala. Before assuming this position in 2000, he served as Chief Executive Officer of Kerala Startup Mission for three years and also worked as Director of Indian Institute of Information Technology and Management Kerala. Dr. Gopinath was associated with Indian Institute of Management over 17 years and its Dean Academics, Dean Development and Professor in Operation Management. He was also the Director of Tapmi Manipal and Founding Dean of Bennett University set up by Times of India. He also serves as visiting faculties to few universities in Europe and Australia. A gold medalist in mechanical engineering 1988 batch from Kerala University, Dr. Gopinas did his PG and PhD in management studies from the Indian Institute of Science. He worked, at, worked in LNT and ONGC before shifting to academics. As a faculty member associated with IIM Kodigod since, since its inspection in 1997, he played a vital role in making as it is one of the top five management schools in the country. Under his leadership, Kerala Startup Mission has been consistently ranked as top performer ecosystem in the country by Government of India and as world's number one public business accelerator by the World's Incubation Summit in 2019. He is also instrumental in converting IIITMK into a University of Digital Sciences Innovation and Technology with a focus to address the research and talent issues uh, of industry 4.0 uh, he has several research papers in reputed journals and consult many leading corporate and national organizations he also serves as in several national committees uh, on education and technology he was also recipient of several awards from national and international bodies british council knowledge economy fellowship tie economy enabler award istd transformation guru award educational leadership award kma technology leadership award cma management leadership award future best ceo award welcome to this uh, interview sir so moving on to the first question uh, as you've been actively involved in the education sector for many years, uh, what is your perspective over the current trend in the education system of India? See, primarily, uh, uh, I always compare the education sector uh, with the industry sector. Okay, so, if you look at the uh, 1990s, uh, uh, we know that the industry business sector in the country yeah. has undergone a substantial change with the liberalization coming. So, one of the things is the regulatory frameworks which govern the industry at that point of time has drastically and if, when you look after 20 years of that, you see that some of these companies at that point of time, or many of the companies at that point of time, including public sector and private sector, are not there. They, they could not cope up with the change. But at the same time, many others have actually grown really, really big and they have grown into multinational companies, they have grown across the world. So the similar situation is happening today for education institutions. We know that uh, the National Education Policy 2020 is actually bringing in a very sweeping changes, both at uh, under, uh, school level as well as in the higher education, especially in the higher education. So just like what the industry's regulatory changes changed during the 90s, we are seeing a drastic change in the regulatory system, uh, uh, which is happening in the, in the uh, education sector. So this is a big challenging time because uh, uh, the education sector, education units which can actually make uh, uh, change with the times can actually excel and can actually move ahead. But if we don't do that, then it ha it the same thing which happened with the industries which did not change the times will can happen here. Because uh, of other things, the national uh, uh, education policy also uh, focuses on individual excellence, the individual excellence of the learner. A lot of autonomy is being given to the learner. Now, conventional education systems in India do not allow that level of freedom and flexibility and learning to the autonomy to the learner per se. That is changing. So you can actually join one institution, but you, part of your courses can be taken from outside. Another institution, you can take it from uh, academic bank of credits. You have a choice of pursuing two or three different areas at a similar time. So there's a, there's a the, the education sector is actually changing to a time where we have not seen earlier at all. So that is a challenge with the institutions as well as individuals, especially faculty members, academic leaders are going to face. How do we actually uh, change and adopt as well as uh, create a 
a, a method to excel in this new world. Oh, no, that's a very good question, good answer. Sir. Uh, having a key position uh, at various educational institutions, what is your philosophy of leadership and what is your leadership strength? Sir? Uh, see, one important thing with academic institutions is that uh, academic institutions perhaps will be the only institutions in the world where uh, there is no hierarchy. Because uh, if you look, we, we always, again, we start comparing education institutions with uh, business and other organizations. If you, if someone asks how many number of business, commercial, uh, industrial organizations which you know more than 100 years old, you hardly know only two or three. If you look at something more than 200 years old, nothing is there. But if you look at universities like Oxford or universities like uh, 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 like say some of the Italian universities, some of the very Cambridge. These are all universities existed for years, right? 300 years, 400 years. So how is that institutions, education institutions last while commercial institutions are not lasting? The reason is these institutions actually follow uh, different models of uh, administration and models of uh, leadership. Uh, in, in, if, you come, if you go to an organization, a okay, commercial organization, uh, a general manager always will be superior to a manager. That's not necessarily the case with a, a professor is not necessarily always superior to an assistant professor. An assistant professor can actually be excel uh, in his or her research or teaching. Not necessarily that the professor is always superior to a It's only the age many times it is more. more okay. So this no, there is no, it's a very, very flat organization. So the, the challenge of leadership is that you are actually managing a group of experts. So you can be, you, your, your, your leadership style should be that you are one among the equals, not not one best. You are one among the equals. There may be a lot of people in your organization who are far better than you in some areas or others, some of the areas per se. So that may not be a case in a, in, a, in an industry where it's a very hierarchical model is involved, can be there. So that's why uh, in our institution as well as in institutions which have excel in the world across the world, we see there's a substantive uh, peer-based uh, systems being practiced. So it is the power of the peer, not the power of the rules or regulations. Yes. It's not more of the power of the peer. And how do I respect? Mm -hmm. It's not the position which people respect. I may be head of the department. That's not what, what respects me. Whether I have better publications than you. But did I actually go into better, uh, academic circles mm -hmm. where I am in uh, mm -hmm. rec recognized form? That is what gives me the, the, the power, not the position per se. So more than the position, it is this. This is uh, this sort of a uh, leadership. This sort of a uh, the, the power of scholarship is the one which drives it. We try to do that uh, in in our institution also to some extent. How do we actually make the power of scholarship going ahead above uh, power of uh, positions? So uh, moving on the next question, sir. Uh, having been in different states in India so in the education sector, uh, what do you see in the minds of the students from different uh, geographies? Yeah, see, this, this varies from uh, the exposure of the students in different uh, levels per se. So, for example, if you if you look at some of the states with, where there is a lot of industries uh, and uh, the students see the the industries and business happening, specifically industries happening, uh, their orientation will be very different from another state where the industries are not there. Mm. All right, so, so they, I mean, it's not necessarily they have to go and see, but at least even around them, they, they say that uh, the people are going in in in, in discipline in particular periods of time they are actually working and you see uh, uh, quite a bit of activities happening there that actually translates that back into the uh, into the, the way students sense for school culture comes. Sure. Now in Kerala that is one challenge which we face because most of them are students are not exposed to industries and because they are not exposed to industries uh, more often than not we may have to actually create that work culture in them in the education but that may not be the case of a student from Maharashtra Maybe a student from Gujarat, which would maybe uh, working closely with, with the industries person. Having said that, there is also a society which, which the way the society respects the education also becomes an important thing. So all these multiple elements of an ecosystem, uh, where you are coming from, what type of support systems you have at your home, what type of industry exposure you have, uh, how the society values education, all these actually determine the way the students feel. Sure. Uh, but Having, having said that, many times uh, our education system many times pushes students to think in a particular level also. Mm -hmm. 
it is changing we are now creating more opportunities for them to learn by uh, uh, work by the uh, uh, learn those sort of systems actually create a change sure that will create a drastic change sir. and moving on to the next question sir. Uh, what kind of extra curricular activities uh, or program does uh, digital university kerala provide for the overall uh, development of the students Okay, Digital University of Kerala is actually very different. Uh, to, to a large extent, it's different from other universities from, because A is a postgraduate university. It's not a, it is, you don't have an undergraduate program. Uh, and uh, being a postgraduate university, we focuses more on uh, creating people who will be uh, ready on day one itself to operate the industry. So a postgraduate student will go into two levels. One is they go into research or they go into immediately after to a job. So we believe that uh, uh, the student who comes out of university should have knowledge which helps them for the lifelong uh, success. At the same time, they need to have their own skills to become uh, relevant for the industry person. So this is, these two things can happen, uh, on, not cannot happen only in classrooms. Classrooms definitely provide them a, a platform where they will get the knowledge, but they also have to have hands-on experience. Sure. So uh, one distinct factor of the university is that uh, almost all our faculty either hold a large research project or a development project. A development project at commercial uh, levels. So this is, this provides them an opportunity for the students to work in live projects, be in project research or be in development and give them the actual experience of working in a live project first. That actually is, to me, is the co-curricular activity. Sure. Uh, but basically, being a small university, we don't have a large playground and things like that. But that, that those things will evolve. More importantly, students can actually spend their extra time involving in their work, uh, not necessarily the what they do in a classroom, but a, in a real practical work, which actually help them earn something. But at the same time, more than that, that also gives them the uh, relevant skills to make them industry ready on day one itself. So that is our distinct feature which we we believe that we have. Sure, thank you. Uh, moving on to the next question, sir. So, being emerging university in India, uh, what kind of question you are trying to portray in the mindset of the students uh, all over the, uh, India or the Kerala or whatever it is? Yeah, uh, this, this is a slightly different thought here. Uh, we, I mean, at least we believe that uh, we are not going to be a very large university. We, we will not have 10,000 or 20,000 students because we believe that university has got uh, two roles to play. One is to create uh, talent uh, for the future. But uh, which is basically where university plays in, in an indirect role in economic development. Then the student will student who pass out of a university will become will contribute to the economy in whichever way, be an industrialist or be a part of industry and things like that. But we also believe that as especially India is growing and our honorable prime minister has given us a challenge uh, for the next 25 years, if you really wanted to realize that challenge. It is important that universities or the knowledge centers also have to play a direct role in developing the economy. We need to be the uh, prime movers of uh, economy to some extent. Uh, but that did not happen much except some of the national institutions. So our, our positioning is that, can we actually play a very important role in developing an industrial ecosystem uh, of newer knowledge industries uh, in the state? We started in a small way, we are creating a, in, an industrial ecosystem for graphene. We are creating in this ecosystem for IoT devices. We are trying to do on 5G. So these sort of areas which we will do it. And our positioning is that if, if a student is coming just for a degree or a, just for a, a course, like anywhere, you can be like rightly pointed out there are n number of universities in the world, in the country. We are not, that is not what we expect them to come. They come here, they get immersed in a live experience. They can actually be, they can actually start a startup. We may be one of the, uh, universities with maximum number of startups under us. We have close to around 80 uh, uh, startups in in technology space, specifically in hardware technologies now. And many of them are well funded also. So so we have a focus on that entrepreneurship incubation space. We have infrastructure to support that. And also we are spinning off uh, different industry ecosystems. So a, a student, somebody who is interested in that is, is, an, is something which we want to post. Second thing is, as a digital university, we are not a virtual university. It's a university which is for the digital world because we believe that uh, almost every area uh, of our economy requires a digital transformation. It's happening also. Uh, and there are areas which is it's yet to have, like agriculture, for example. 
the, it, it to happen a more involvement of uh, uh, digital technology. technology. We have National Digital Livelihood Mission and things like that is there. So such areas we have digital transformation projects. So somebody who is interested in looking at the societal development angle, trying to put on that, that again we, are, we have a right uh, space. In fact, every student who comes here undergo a program for digital access for community empowerment, where they actually work, uh, they go into a community, it could be a fisherman community, it could be a tribal community, it could be a water, uh, water. people who are generally being marginalized sort of a thing. You go there, you study their problems and see how digital solutions can actually be applied to solve their problems, which can be a research project or a, a development project. So these are some of the unique things which we try to do. These are the best training things right now that we try in our university. Uh, Moving to the next question from uh, what, what do you see as a DUP in the next 10 years? Uh, what measures are you planning to take? Yeah, see, as I said, this is, we are in a very, very flexible uh, stage, right? So, uh, so we, we cannot really make a, a major uh, sort of, we cannot fix the full targets at this point of time. Uh, but uh, if I look at from a broad strategic point of view, we believe that uh, we wanted to position us as a university which can create industrial ecosystems either directly or in support with others. That is one of our key elements. Uh, we wanted to look at uh, ex the creation of knowledge in several areas in digital science space. And uh, much closer to home, we, we as, a, as a new university, we need to get into a, an accreditation for NAC and other things. In maybe two to three years' time, like to get into national ranking frameworks and all in a very short period. And then, like to be positioned as a university which support uh, people in their uh, in their learning path uh, and also want to support their entrepreneurship and uh, innovation space. Uh, these are some of the areas which we will be looking at. Uh, specific targets are there, but that I think is not relevant in this. But and that is again we focus based upon current realities, as I said. In a flexible world, the realities change very fast. We may have to reconfigure that as we proceed. So, uh, all the best for your future culture. And uh, moving to the next question, uh, how do you standardize the curriculum and how often uh, it updated to meet the industry standards? Yeah, so uh, we are actually having a very flexible curriculum. Uh, uh, that And uh, it is updated every year. We have a very, very strong uh, board of studies in every school. And all the board of studies have got people from industry and board of studies actually meets at least twice in a year and uh, every year they actually go through the curriculum and see how that can actually be changed and to meet the industry requirements of course there's an internship but in addition to that as I said we take live industry projects we get uh, embedded in that uh, uh, and plus we are also allowing students to take courses from other parts like 20% of the courses they can take from either MOOCs or other universities etc as a part of the curriculum if they want to do that. That flexibility has been given. The, the idea is that India is moving to an area where we are providing students with a lot of flexibility and we should move with the time. And as a university we started very recently in the time of NEP, we need to be, we need to actually, we have the, we have the uh, advantage of actually structuring your curriculums around that. So that's something which uh, we, we are attending. Sure. So now, it's good to so, moving on to the last question, sir. Uh, what seed uh, you would like to plant in the mind of weavers on this interview? I believe these are the you know, students, right? Yes. Uh, well, see, the, uh, it's, it's very simple. Uh, uh, if you look at the past, uh, let's say 200, 300 years, at different points of time, different parts of the world actually excel. So, if you look at the modern industrial world, it was Europe in the first. Then it was US, and we have seen the rise of China and Southeast Asia during the last uh, maybe 20, 30 years. Now I believe it is a time of India. It's a very youth country, sure. and that can happen only if the youth of the country actually rise to that. So uh, there is a substantive change which people have to make uh, in the country because we were we were always in the world of being taught. So the, from the school days onwards, we have been taught, taught, taught. Uh, very rarely we allow students uh, to do by themselves. But today that's just not the world. The world is full of resources. You have your own uh, learning paths which you can take. 
So whichever institutions uh, a new student joins, you always will have an opportunity to excel in few other areas. The earlier when I did my mechanical engineering, I can do only mechanical engineering. But today when a student is doing mechanical engineering, he will like music. He can actually do a music from modern university or six the world along with that, mm -hmm. without uh, compromising anything. Mm -hmm. So that is the uh, important thing. The, the, the world is always uh, successful when people do what they like to do and uh, what they learn, what they like to learn. And that opportunity is there. So that is a thing which I believe it's uh, well we are providing. Yes. And that is something which I think uh, uh, the, and institutions are also now being flexible to that. So being just examination oriented and things like that to move to this sort of a larger thing is what I believe uh, yes. people should do and that is needed more, more for them but much more for the country because the country has to become the leader in the whole industrial revolution of the new world and the type of uh, dreams our the Prime Minister has given us and other leaders have given us. That is a, a path. Yes. So thank you for your wonderful words. So your thoughts are uh, maybe useful for many students who are looking upon our future. So thank you for giving me this. Thank you. Thank you. Sir.